goes straight into my paper, and um, I believe I distributed a copy. So, if, um, but if anybody needs me to slow down, uh, let me know. Uh, or if anything uh, you don't understand, please tell me. Although we know that the world needs a transition to more sustainable mobilities, and that we need to reduce our energy consumption, reduce greenhouse gases, cause less harm to the living world, the existing infrastructures and everyday landscape of uneven mobilities has made it very difficult to transform our carbon intensive urban patterns of living. And that has been really the key issue driving the beginning of the new mobilities paradigm. So from the start we were thinking about this world that we've created and how can we change it. In fact, there is a huge resistance to real transformation because it will require some groups to give up the power that's embodied in luxury mobilities, in excess energy consumption and excess waste. And that's what I'm going to talk about today is the difference in consumption of mobility and consumption of energy. There are also powerful corporations and industries that have an interest in continuing the existing system. And I want to focus on where change would have to happen. So as you know, over the past 15 to 20 years, the theoretical perspective known as the new mobilities paradigm has developed to address the combined and uneven mobilities of capital, people, commodities, and information, and other things, also mobilities of nature, mobilities of culture and ideas. Um, this book, Mobilities and Complexities, uh, is one that I co-edited with Sven Kesselring and Ole Jensen, which is a tribute to the work of John Uri. And it's a book that's about all the people who were influenced by his thinking, who've written small descriptions of how their work was influenced by John Uri. So I wanted to put that in as a tribute to him as the sort of person who together um, co-founded this field and has really been one of the prime uh, leaders of it until his unfortunate passing too soon. So mobility's research focuses on the constitutive role of movement within the workings of most social institutions and social practices, and focuses on the organization of power around systems of governing mobilities and immobilities at various scales. And I often use the word immobilities as here in parentheses, so it says immobilities as a reminder that with mobilities there are always immobilities, they're always together. So mobilities research focuses not simply on movement alone, but on what I describe as the power of discourses, practices, and infrastructures of mobility in creating the effects of both movement and stasis. So it's about movement itself, but it's also about the perception of movement or the discourse of movement and how movement is imagined and how movement is um, narrated in some ways. So in that sense, it's a humanities topic, right? Because it's about the discourse of mobilities as well as the actual mobilities. Um, and I think in terms of processes of mobilization and demobilization, voluntary and involuntary movements. And I focus on how powerful mobility regimes govern who and what can move or stay put, when, where, how, under what conditions, and with what meanings. And I think the field of mobilities research has really tried to combine this idea of um, meanings and stories of mobility. And so it really brings social sciences together with humanities. So problems of uneven motility, and I use the word motility to mean potential for movement, as Vincent Kaufman has written about it. The problems of uneven motility and of mobility rights, ethics, and justice 
have become crucial to the field of mobility's research. There has been increasing attention to concepts such as differential mobility, uneven mobilities, motility, as a uneven sort of capabilities for movement, um, and questions of power, justice, and mobility rights. Mobility's research, therefore, has a normative dimension. It engages not only in critical analysis of historical and existing mobility systems, but also tries to model future transitions that might help to bring about alternative cultures of mobility. So while some social science just kind of studies the empirical world and describes it and tries to explain causal factors, this is the kind of social science that is normative, which is that it's uh, suggesting a kind of ethical uh, stance towards the contemporary world and where it might move towards in the future. Our, our approach originated out of what was called the spatial turn in the social sciences, and people now talk about the mobilities turn. And a key moment in the sociology of space involved debates that were originally um, coming out of the reception in the English-speaking world of Henri Lefebvre's work, La Production de l'Espace. So it was published in French in 1974, but it was only translated into English in 1991. So although there had been earlier discussions of it by people who read French or studied French, the English uh, debates about the production of space happened in the 1990s. And at the same time, there was the influence of Doreen Massey, who was a British geographer. Uh, her work, Spatial Divisions of Labor, uh, and, uh, and some of her subsequent work. And these two influential texts examined the complex and varied movements of capital into and out of place, and talked about the resulting forms of what we, uh, Doreen Massey called sedimentation, this kind of structuring of space as capital moves through the world. Um, and that's a spatial formation that occurs within each place and then produces struggles over space and its production. So both Lefebvre and Massey's work influenced the emergence of a relational analysis of space, emphasizing that space was the production of interrelations and always under construction. And this kind of approach influenced John Nari's work in the 1990s and was also, he was also concerned with space and the social relations of its production. He talked about space as a set of relations between entities rather than a container or an empty kind of holder that we just kind of move through. And that would lead to Ari's idea of mobile sociology and his book, Sociology Beyond Societies, at the turn of the millennium. And I should say, around that same time is when I arrived at Lancaster University in 1999 and started working with John, and we published our first article together in 2000. So that... Uh, period led to this idea of a system of automobility. And in our article, The City and the Car, that was published in the International Journal of Urban and Regional Research, we talked about automobility not just as a, as a means of transportation, but as a culturally shaped assemblage of ongoing relations between actors, actions, meanings, and spaces. And I don't know how familiar you are with this, but this was the sort of uh, description of this dominant system of automobility. And it involves the car as the quintessential manufactured object produced by the leading industrial sectors and the iconic firms of 20th century capitalism. So when you think about Ford or Mercedes or Toyota, they defined 20th century capitalism. And we talk about you know, Fordism and post-Fordism and things like that. Cars are also the major item of individual consumption after housing, which provides status to its owner or user 
through the sign values with which the car is associated. And I have to say, coming here to Seoul, there's probably nowhere else where I, I have seen such a powerful status symbol and sign value in the cars and the car dealerships in Gangnam. Um, it's quite a car culture. The car also, though, is not just the object itself, but it's part of this powerful machinic complex. It's this idea that the car is linked through many other industries to all sorts of other aspects of the social and industrial world. So it's not just cars, but it's you know the oil companies and construction of roads and trucking and logistics and all the all the industries related with with car, uh, the car system. It's also the predominant global form of quasi-private mobility that subordinates other public mobilities of walking, cycling, traveling by rail, and so on. So the car reorganizes how people negotiate opportunities for and constraints upon work, family life, leisure, and pleasure. So this system of automobility, this construction of the world around cars, shaped how we live our lives, our most personal, intimate, familial, friendship, um, all of those things are shaped by this system of automobility. It's also the dominant culture that sustains major discourses of what constitutes the good life, what is necessary for an appropriate citizenship of mobility. And it then provides potent literary and artistic images and symbols. So car culture um, became a way of expressing cultures of modernity, of modernization, of um, good, good citizenship, the good mobile subject uh, became the car driver, good parenting involved taking care of children or of family through the use of the car as a, as a technology, um, not just of transportation, but of sort of living a good life. And then finally, the car became the single most important cause of environmental resource use, resulting from the exceptional range and scale of material, space, and power used in the manufacture of cars, of roads, of car-only environments, and in coping with the environmental impacts of this system. So that was the description in our work um, around 2000 of the system of automobility. So this was 1999 that we were probably thinking about this. Of course, car culture has become even bigger in the last 20 years. It's spread more, more cars are being driven, more roads are built, and cities, I think, are increasingly struggling with how to cope with this system and its environmental impacts. This multi-layered vision of a complex system of automobility helps us get beyond thinking of transportation in isolation as simply a way of getting from A to B, which is how it was always treated in transport studies and, of course, in engineering and in urban planning. It was just transportation. But we were trying to open a far wider terrain to think about its transformative potential. So in sum, the mobility's turn calls for new ways of comprehending the power dimensions and the politics of mobilities within this kind of infrastructural landscape. So I wanted to just introduce that idea um, of the sort of origins of the mobility turn and how we started thinking about this um, system of automobility. But what I'm going to do in today's talk is um, focus in on mobility justice and um, the book, which has, I'm um, very grateful, has been translated into Korean, so more people here can read it, I hope, um, and I'm very happy to see that. Um, this is the English edition, uh, published by Verso. So the question kind of driving the book is, how can we now transform this existing dominant system, which is what is one of the key co contributors to the the death of our planetary ecology. Um, although you could say buildings also are 
big producer of CO2, carbon dioxide. It's the entire system we're talking about of how we build our cities, how we move around, and the system of automobility is what we see as having formed our cities the way they are and are what needs to change. In my book, Mobility Justice, I seek to situate debates over sustainable transportation and low carbon transitions in the context of a wider analysis of unequal mobilities and unequal mobility regimes. And so I include not just transportation, which has often been the focus of the discussion of sustainable mobility, but also things like the rights to migration and cross-border mobilities, and also larger planetary scale movements of resources and energy that also are part of a sort of circulation of not just people, but goods and things. So mobility justice is an overarching concept for thinking about how power and inequality inform the governance and control of movement, shaping patterns of unequal mobility and immobility in the circulation of people, resources, and information. So the book is organized um, by trying to think across scales and different systems, and this graphic is just to represent the sort of five core chapters of the book, which are about these different scales. And I begin from the micro level, what I call the body, right? In embodied interpersonal relations, um, how we move as individuals, um, how we uh, interact with each other in, in movement. And then I move up to this kind of middle range level of urban streets and transportation and movements um, around transportation justice and the right to the city. And then I look at sort of the city as a whole, the urban infrastructure and how that's formed. And then at a more macro level, the transnational relations of travel and crossing borders. And finally, global resource flows and what I call the planetary or global scale. And the core of the argument is that we need to connect these scales of the body, the street, the city, the nation, and the planet into an overarching theory of mobility justice. Because we need a, a double transition, what I call a dual transition, not just towards environmental sustainable, just environmentally sustainable mobilities, but also greater mobility justice because that's the only way that we can ensure that future urban mobility transitions will not sort of dig in even greater social inequities, exclusions, and externalization of harms. So to make this argument, I talk about the idea of a triple crisis. Drawing on the new mobilities paradigm and this theorization of mobility justice, I want to try to show connections between these three aspects of um, a crisis of mobility, which includes the urban crisis of congestion, air pollution, and also growing urban inequality, the climate crisis, global warming, extinction, um, and the urgent need for a post-car and post-carbon transition to deal with the climate crisis, and thirdly, the migration crisis, which is, I think of in terms of the failure of our current border regimes, which, as I, and here I was especially thinking about the United States, but also Europe, uh, where there have been the deaths of refugees from the global south, right? Deaths in the Mediterranean at sea, or in the deserts on Mexico, uh, US border. And then the, the rise of this kind of very racist ethnocentrism which has produced these detention camps. Um, in, in the United States, people even are referring to it as concentration camps, where refugees um, are not only being stopped, but families are being separated. Children, up to 7,000 children, have been separated from their parents and put in these detention centers, and they're unable to reunite them with their families. They, they didn't even keep track of who their parents were and how to find them. And so that's what I'm talking about is the migration crisis. So to understand this triple crisis, 
I believe that um, we need to connect elite mobilities and subaltern mobilities. We need to think about the, the relationship, for example, between the mobilities of refugees, the mobilities of tourists, the mobilities of uh, the military, the mobility of global logistics, and the racialized or gendered mobilities that are uh, used in the policing of everyday bodily movement. And also phenomena like homelessness and people who are sort of left out. So the concept of mobility justice takes our attention beyond just transportation justice or spatial justice, sometimes called the right to the city, towards a wider terrain of thinking about uneven movement and managed mobilities grounded um, in the case of Europe and the United States in colonial histories and the management of these differentiated mobility regimes. A more robust and comprehensive theory of mobility justice can help us address this combined crisis of unsustainable urban life, unsustainable mobilities, and unsustainable borders. Current approaches to justice, I argue, have also not um, focused on how justice is a spatial relation, how justice is embodied in differences of class, gender, race, ethnicity, nationality. Truly addressing the un injustices of unequal mobilities requires that we develop a deeper understanding of how uneven mobility relates not just to how we move around cities, but also to these racialized and gendered colonial histories and neo-colonial presence, and also the geo-ecological and geopolitical base of planetary mobilities in extractive industries such as mining and energy production, because it's that system that enables the system of automobility, which shapes the form of urban life, which we sometimes have started referring to as carbon form, like the very architecture of our cities and our highways and our nations is a carbon form. It's based in the carbon economy. It's based in fossil fuel energy production and mining. So if we, seek, if we want to seek to abide by principles of mobility justice, what kind of built forms would support greater mobility justice? What kind of social practices? What kind of infrastructures? And what kind of meanings and narratives would support a more just mobility? Where should we direct our attention in building more just mobility cultures and forms of governance across multiple scales at once? We need regional and urban planning processes that reject technological determinism and claims of market inevitability. And here I'm referring to the arguments that, well, we just need electric cars and that will solve everything, right? If we just had better technology, if we could capture carbon and store it, like that will, that will fix everything. Because I think we need a deeper analysis and we need to question even the kind of green or sustainable projects of eco-modernization if they do not also ensure justice, that it is deliberative justice and procedural justice facilitating communication across different communities and across different social strata to purposely build more equitable mobility futures. So I refer to this as um, kino political movements. The concept of kino politics came partly from the work of Thomas Nail, who's a philosopher who's written about the politics of mobility, kino meaning like moving. Move, politics of movement. And I believe that we need to have these social movements and social mobilizations that bring out and, and bring to the surface these kino political relations. Such movements for mobility justice are already beginning to mobilize in a wide range of domains. So I think about it in terms of these different kinds of political struggles. Struggles, for example, over unequal embodied relations of race, gender, age, disability, sexuality, which inform uneven freedom of mobility and unequal capabilities to move. 
So, for example, in the book I give um, examples <coughs> of um, movements like the Black Lives Matter movement, where they, people really showed how the police were harassing and stopping and um, interrupting black mobility, whether it was people walking down the street or particularly driving cars. There are these uneven rates of stop and frisk or arresting people or ticketing people. And it's a, a kind of machinery of control of movement in the United States, which dates back to slavery and emancipation, but it's kind of became ingrained in our policing system. So that's one example. Um, but also critical disability scholars have also had protest movements where they've done wheel-ins, uh, where they take wheelchairs to subway stations that are not accessible, and they just stop at the <coughs> steps and, and show by just being there how unfair and unequal it is if they can't move. Um, and also women's movements that have also protested the kind of sexual harassment of women on public streets or public um, transportation, things like that. Secondly, there are struggles for the right to the city and the public sphere with a politics of occupation and presence in public space that disrupts normalized mobility spaces. So any kind of protest movement that focuses on disrupting mobility, right? Uh, blocking roads, interrupting travel is one form of kiddo political struggle, which is to be in the public sphere, to get attention, people stop the traffic, right? That's of course, uh, it could be at a subway or it could be at an airport. It's a very controversial way of making a political claim, but it's a very effective one. Um, of course, in, in France, in particular, we've seen the uh, Gilets Jaunes movement, which um, were protesting uh, partly against the increase in fuel prices, but they blocked roads to kind of claim their right to mobility. Thirdly, there are struggles over ethical spaces for contesting borders and migration policies and the reception of refugees within the context of securitized and militarized borders. And so in the United States recently, for example, we've seen a lot of movements um, protesting the Trump administration's policies around migration. Um, when at the very beginning of his presidency, um, when he tried to block migration from predominantly Muslim countries, people went to airports and protested which was very unusual, because airports are very secure spaces. But I went to one in Philadelphia, and it was amazing to see hundreds, possibly more than a thousand people standing on at the airport where normally cars drive up and pick up and drop off passengers. And we occupied that space and had a protest, and we marched from Terminal A to Terminal F. And I had never seen that kind of airport protest in the US, but it was to say that we welcome refugees and it's unconstitutional to block <coughs> people on the basis of nationality or religion uh, just like full sweep like that um, and then finally there are struggles over the just circulation of goods resources and energy in our global capitalist system where there is no procedural justice on the distribution of what i call planetary matter and energy. So protests over mining, protests over oil pipelines, protests uh, like in Canada right now around tar sands mining, which they're, they're, uh, Justin Trudeau is about to make a decision this week of whether to give a permit for the biggest mine ever in Alberta that would sort of produce so much carbon that it would ruin any targets that Canada might be setting to bring down its CO2 levels. It would be completely offset if he permits this mine, um, tar sands mining for this oil that's very polluting, things like that. So those, so these are all very different kinds of struggles, but I see them all as different facets of this kinopolitical movements that are contesting how mobility is structured in the world. So in the, in the next section of the talk, I want to kind of zero in on two aspects of these movements. And first, I'm going to bring attention to this idea of kinetic elites 
And then secondly, I'm going to address the question of climate refugees. So the next part of the talk is about <coughs> kinetic elites and moral responsibility. So elite mobilities are often hidden or secluded from the public gaze. Yet attention to privileged forms of mobility can help us better understand the power that's inherent in systems of uneven mobility. And I use here an image of a private jet and a Range Rover to represent these kind of luxury elite mobilities. By recognizing how power is exercised through the control of mobilities, we can better understand why the kinetic elite are reluctant to give up their enjoyment of unfettered mobilities. Air travel, luxury vehicles, multiple houses, international lifestyles, perhaps stocks invested in fossil fuel companies or other industries related to mobility. People with mobility privilege are unwilling to limit their access to places and things and are reluctant to change the systems that bring them all the conveniences of life. Or perhaps I should say, we are reluctant to limit our enjoyment because many of us in the upper income levels of highly industrialized countries enjoy the benefits of easy mobilities. High energy fossil fuels enable our personal automobile travel, our access to tourism, and the huge choice of products that are brought to us from around the world. So I include myself when I talk about the kinetic elite, especially as an academic researcher. I travel around the world a lot. Coming to events like this, I have a very big carbon footprint. And, and it's irrational because I know, I know I'm having an impact on the planet, and yet I keep acting and doing the things I do. And it's so difficult for us to limit ourselves, to make ourselves stop. So mobility scholars have observed that there's a political unwillingness to acknowledge that there are huge differences in the power geometries of individual mobility, with a minor share of highly mobile travelers being responsible for a significant share of the overall distance traveled and the emissions associated with this transport. So when we talk about, say, like the Anthropocene, you've heard that term to talk about the current age of man's impact on the environment, it's not all of man, all of humanity. It's a small proportion of us who have consumed more energy and more fossil fuel. And climate scientist Kevin Anderson has argued that if the top 10% of energy consumers in the world brought their carbon footprint down to just the average, we would be able to eliminate 40% of CO2 emissions. So when we talk about mobility limits or austerity, um, reducing carbon, it's that top 10% who are the ones who are causing a lot of the problem, a big proportion of the problem. In addition to driving large engine luxury cars and as I said, living in multiple places with high energy demands, you know, bigger houses, more appliances, more travel, um, producing hugely disproportionate, disproportionate amounts of um, CO2. There's a, a small proportion of privileged travelers who engage in frequent long distance travel and what might even be called binge flying. And the, and the groups Binge flying are um, not the majority of populations anywhere. It's like a small group who repeatedly fly, which has a big carbon footprint. But more broadly speaking, there's a politics of uneven access to global air travel, just as there is to automobility. And it's institutionalized within regimes of air rights, technical expertise, and aviation security. According to the geographer of air mobility, Lin Wei Chang, who's at um, NUS in Singapore. There is, he argues, an overt sense that the air world is a hierarchical, racialized, and unequal one, according differential rights to different people in terms of their ability to move, consume, and use resources. 
This renders flying an issue of mobility, justice, par excellence, he argues, that is deserving of greater vocalization and activism. So just as we call attention to the uneven um, auto mobility, there's also uneven aero mobility. The excess of mobilities and mobile consumer culture that we enjoy underpins why we are so fearful of what will happen if others encroach on our advantages and try to limit our mobilities. Most of us keep driving cars, we keep flying, we keep ordering online and having packages delivered to our doors from anywhere, and we expect the logistical systems of life to just keep working. Um, all business planning is done on the basis that this is just going to keep growing. It's a growth economy. It's predicted by the UN World Tourism Organization that there could be 1.8 billion tourists traveling annually by 2030. And that, maybe that prediction is out of date. It might even be higher than that by now. And so I come back to the question of what is the relation between tourism and the right to travel across borders, migration? Um, what, why are some people's movements limited while others are enjoying more and more accessibility of other places? What kinds of uneven infrastructures support or stop various kinds of tourism, travel, or migration? And does the tourism industry itself shape particular flows of undocumented, as well as documented, migration of workers, for example, in hotel services, or drivers, or food service, or agriculture? Uh, many of our uh, economies depend on migrant workers, and certainly in the United States, in Canada, in Australia, um, in the UK. I don't know how it works in the economy here, but those economies depend on migrant workforces, and yet we have these tight controls over migration and who's allowed in and whose mobility is highly controlled. Mobility theorists have developed the concept of friction to classify some of these differentials in mobility capabilities. So for example, Michael O'Regan and Kevin Hannum pointed out that the increasing development of low friction travel in the tourism industry, and they describe how travel and tourism is made frictionless when hotel apps try to create this kind of seamless journey of check-in using a transit system, um, online platforms such as B &B, Airbnb, they create this illusion of friction-free exchange through the absence of paperwork and these kind of automatic payment systems. And that produces feelings of smooth travel, which are more, even more extreme in the realm um, of private jets, private airports, where there are no queues to wait in, where people can just kind of uh, come and go. And Anthony Elliott describes the mobile lives of the group that he calls globals, mobile globals, who practice lifestyles that he describes as encompassing detached engagement, floating, speed, networked possibilities, distance from locality, and mapping of escape routes. And this might all sound extreme, but given the growing sort of economic divide in many countries, there is a group at the top who experience life more this way because they have so much wealth that they're able to have this kind of lifestyle of floating and of um, mapping out where, where they can go, imagining that whatever happens, they'll be able to escape what, where other people are completely trapped. This valorization of friction-free mobility comes at the expense of others whose class, race, gender, age, or abilities subjects them to slower travel, to airport security searches, or lack of access altogether to travel documents, or low-waged work in the tourism sector, in which their time and movements are controlled and monopolized to serve others. Movements for mobility justice um, include those who are arguing for what in Sweden is called fly shaming, or the no-fly movement. Um, and they are trying to encourage people to reduce their flights. And this is starting to spread across Europe. 
um, where many organizations are asking people not to hold meetings in person, but to try to do distance meetings and things like that, or to take trains. But we should be as concerned with uh, dismantling systems of privilege and premium access and differential rights to mobility, as well as with protecting subaltern subjects from exclusion and detainment and eviction and refusal of entry. So now I want to start to look at the flip side of this process, which is those who are forced to move. So while movement is sometimes seen as desirable and it's a capability of the kinetic elite, there's also the forced displacement and the forced movement, in particular of climate refugees, of people whose home land has become unlivable. So global mobility patterns have always had an underside of coerced mobility and involuntary uh, things like enslavement, but also deportation, detention, um, many ways in which there have been forced mobilities as well as forced <coughs> immobilities. Histories of human migration and displacement are a crucial starting point for thinking about the relation uh, especially between racial projects and mobility regimes. And here I'm thinking especially about Western countries and the kind of what are called the white settler nations, which were built upon indigenous dispossession, that is taking land of indigenous or aboriginal people, and also systems of plantation slavery. Historian Anne-Laura Stoller reminds us that there's a deep history of overlap between these different kinds of spaces that were agricultural colonies, prison colonies, where people were sent as a punishment, like Australia, um, resettlement camps, where displaced people had to move, uh, detention centers, where migrants were held or detained, and also island military bases and settler communities. She describes all of these as nodes in an imperial network. Ultimately, imperialism, she says, depended on strategic mobilities and influenced immobilities of persons recruited or forced into and out of colonies and camps by imperial design. Power over immobilities and mobilities are built into contemporary regimes and state bordering practices today. Uneven mobilities allowed for the resource extraction that built colonial worlds and were braided into ongoing forms of territorial appropriation and what I call elite secession that underwrite contemporary global inequalities between the global north and global south, as well as within each. And by elite secession, I'm referring to the way in which these kind of kinetic elites can take themselves out of sort of the social contract, can protect themselves and their money by uh, offshore banking, by dual residency and citizenship in multiple jurisdictions, by kind of escaping normal forms of taxation and um, national kind of what, we, what one owes to the nation. And so there's this kind of islanding, uh, seceding, which is how elites kind of protect the, the ability for the rest of society to get a hold on them. So citizenship has become a key site for the differential management of transnational mobilities. And mobilities are a key site for production of the nation itself. And I go back to Max Weber's definition of the state. Uh, he's a German sociologist who defined the state as a monopoly of legitimate violence. And that idea was taken up um, at the bottom there by John Torpy, who wrote the history of the passport as a way to understand the state, not just as a monopoly of legitimate violence, but a monopoly of legitimate mobility. So if in the past, humans were always moving and always uh, borders were kind of hazy, frontiers and different groups moved around uh, over those borders, the state began to impose the passport as a way to monopolize mobility and control who could move and who couldn't move. 
uh, and data collection, and now, of course, we have biometric data and all of these ways in which our mobility is um, tracked by the state. The late sociologist Zygmunt ba Bowman observed in 1998 already that differentiated citizenship regimes were the metaphor for the new emergent stratification in which he wrote, it is now the access to global mobility which has been raised to the topmost rank among the stratifying factors. And I think that, again, has intensified since the turn of the millennium over the last 20 years, even more so, is there a stratification of who has access to global mobility and who doesn't. And likewise, in 2001, uh, Jeanette Verstreet argued that in Europe, the freedom of mobility for some citizens, tourists, business people, is only made possible through the organized exclusion of others forced to move around as illegal aliens, migrants, or refugees. So there's this exercise of state powers stopping some people from crossing borders, even while allowing others to speed through easily. And this has only intensified. Rhys Jones, who um, also has written uh, the book called Violent Borders, he argues that the existence of the border itself produces the violence that surrounds it. The border creates the economic and jurisdictional discontinuities that have come to be seen as its hallmarks, providing an impetus for the movement of people, goods, drugs, weapons, and money across it. So it's kind of arguing that the border is what makes the profitability of people moving things across it and trafficking people, um, trafficking drugs, trafficking weapons. If the border wasn't there, it wouldn't be a site of violence in the same way. And then also today, more than ever, these borderlands are soaked in the blood of nationalism through the citizenship regimes, ethnic profiling, and what has become a kind of enforced death in the no man's land of the border, where, as I said, boats sink in the Mediterranean or people die in the desert in uh, the US border. And Jones argues that this is why the hardening of the border through new security practices is the source of the violence, not a response to it. Others have argued that borders are not simply edges, limits, or barriers for controlling mobility in and out of adjacent territories, nor does territory pre-exist the border, but instead the relation between the two terms can be understood as bordering practices. So borders are increasingly being understood as these kind of sets of practices um, and that they move, it's mobile practices where the border has moved inland, the border is found on our bodies um, in the way our data is kept or our, our passport, our biometrics, the border moves around with us and um, border stops are, are happening um, not just at that line, the hard militarized border, but all over the place. So there is um, a current sort of crisis within borders. Oh, sorry, I think I'm one slide behind myself. So that's the one I was just talking about. Um, okay, let's move on to the next one. The crisis of borders has emboldened what is called a no borders movement, which is contesting these kinopolitical regimes. A no borders perspective insists that people should not be categorized through inherently exclusionary state forms of identification, such as migrant or citizen, in a way that punishes non-citizens. So the open borders argument is made on the basis of historical injustices in capitalism and colonialism and imperialism, which have left people in different parts of the world either highly advantaged or disadvantaged in the global economy. Advocates, therefore, argue that a no borders perspective argues for demolishing any kind of citizenship categorization as a precondition for social protection and for being social. So what that means is they're not saying there should be no citizenship or no borders whatsoever. They're saying it should not be the determination of social protection, meaning because someone is not a citizen does not mean you can leave them 
to sink to their death in a boat or leave them in the desert without water. And these are things that are happening right now to thousands of people. So the argument is that this order category of citizen, non-citizen should be called into question when the state stops social protection at its border. And it calls for a more ethical and humanistic approach to our common humanity, and that we should not allow states to just let people die because they're not a citizen, or to detain people in concentration camps because they're not a citizen, or to take children away from their parents because they're not citizens. That's just completely wrong, and um, moral philosophy should kind of step up and make that argument. And it has, because even if we accept that states do have some discretionary right to control immigration, moral philosophers such as Joseph Karens have argued that widely accepted democratic norms still place moral limits on the state's control over who counts as a member and how you can treat people as members or non-members of the state. There are still moral limits to what the state should be able to do. And he, along with others, argues that there's a case to be made for open borders as a principle of justice within democratic polities. This case is made strongly by Rhys Jones in his book, Violent Borders, Refugees and the Right to Move, when he asks the deceptively simple question, after centuries of state practices designed to regulate and control movement, why do so many people continue to die at the edges of modern, civilized, and democratic states? If stopping migration leads to death, and if the distinction between refugees and so-called economic migrants is not clear, then should not borders be more open and permeable? And that's the case being made by no borders activist resistance. It implies a radical right to human freedom of movement for protection of life. Joseph Nevins argues for a right to the world, including to a homeland that is sustainable and secure, and a right to a just share of the Earth's resources. So I think these arguments are important for thinking about climate refugees and the situation increasingly in the world where people will lack water, agriculture will fail, and people will have to move. And what will be our ethical obligation to those people? And do countries need to think about accepting climate refugees when there is no other option for them to survive? And what will that mean for us in the future? So this um, leads me in the book to develop principles of mobility justice. And each chapter actually ends with different sets of principles <coughs> regarding each scale. These are the principles that have to do with the national scale. And, um, and some of these are, uh, these already exist within the UN Convention for Human Rights, uh, that all people shall enjoy a right to exit and re-enter the territory from which they originate. And there's a right to refuge for those fleeing violence, persecution, and loss of domicile by war. So those are the existing recognized uh, UN conventions but they're not being practiced everywhere at the moment, and they're being undermined, and so we need to be reminded of them. But the third one at the top is, does not exist yet, which is that people displaced by climate change shall have a right to resettlement in other countries, especially in those countries that contributed most to climate change. And I refer here to my own country in particular, the United States, which has been the major contributor historically and still to climate change, and has an economy that depends on migrant labor and has a declining population without migration. So why on earth should the United States refuse to accept migrants as it is currently doing? It's currently restricting migration and it's currently, as I said, building a border wall, stopping uh, refugee and asylum claim that's from entering the country. Um, so Americans are protesting that, right? But there's sanctuary movements, there's uh, protests against the Trump administration, but like we need to make, I believe, this more clearly um, stated as part of a principle of mobility justice. And we need to think about the international level, how can we enshrine that right in, in ways that it, it's not at the moment. Um, and 
Yeah, and there's a few other principles there, like no one should be detained or deported without due process. Um, and immigration law shall not be used to exclude entire categories of persons on the basis of race, religion, ethnicity, nationality, sexuality, or health status, which currently should be happening but is not happening. It starts increasingly being, those norms are being uh, violated by states. So I want to move towards some conclusions. Um, and uh, these are images of climate, people displaced by climate change. Um, and you know, this in this year of 2019, more people have been displaced by climate disasters than at any time ever in, in world history. Um, whether it's typhoons or droughts or um, flooding, um, hurricanes, um, all of these events are increasing. So I have a few different conclusions. Um, with each car trip that we take, with each air flight, with each uh, plastic bottle or aluminum can that we toss in the trash, with each super air-conditioned high-rise building we use, we are each complicit in the unsustainable fossil fuel mobility regime. But even if we were to create more ecological urbanism, I want to argue that we must not let it become uh, what Hudson and Marvin call a premium ecological enclave, available only to those insiders who are protected by rights of citizenship. Mobility justice means that ecological urbanism and green cities cannot come at the expense of the marginalized poor, the migrant, or the excluded minority. Because without mobility justice, we cannot achieve planetary sustainability. No matter how green or sustainable you might make your city or even your country, if it's exporting harm and pollution and production to other places, globally it hasn't made a difference. And if it's keeping other people out and leaving them to die outside the borders, it has not made a difference. So the mobilization of um, many new social movements around climate change and social injustices are starting to make this connection. It includes movements um, and calls for the Green New Deal, which is prominent right now in the US and in the UK and in some other countries. Um, the Sunrise Movement in the USA, which is young people, uh, college and high school age, who are demanding that the government do something about climate change. Uh, the Extinction Rebellion, which has come for, out of the UK, I believe, originally, but it spread to other countries. The Children's Strikes for Climate, um, the Greta Thunberg, who's gotten a lot of attention for that, but many other children have been also calling for this and striking for climate. All of these movements are starting to create a new political context in which to create mobilizations around mobility justice. And I argue in the book that the new mobilities paradigm can help us build more politically effective political alliances and gain greater leverage over these urgent problems that will shape our ways of moving, mobilizing, dwelling, and living in the near and distant future. We need to move beyond treating transport justice, spatial justice, migrant justice, environmental justice, climate justice as separate issues. They're all interconnected forms of struggle over the politics of immobility or kiddo politics, and they each directly impinge on each other. They're completely connected. A holistic theory of mobility justice can help us perceive these connections across different regimes of mobility, different scales of mobility, ranging from the racialized and gendered body to the detention of migrants to the ease of travel for global elites. And finally, I just want to add that I believe the humanities are crucial for enabling us to imagine alternative mobility futures to help us recover the moral philosophies and the kinds of meanings and narratives that can lead us beyond the current impasse, beyond walled off nationalism and toward a greater ecological humanism. So I see uh, crucial importance for the future of mobilities and humanities to help advance this kind of discussion. <laughs>
Thank you, and I'm looking forward to your questions.